Hello, students. Today, what we want to talk about are the root and ratio tests, uh, which will continue, continue our study of infinite series. This is right before we get into the uh, concept of the Taylor polynomial and power series. So, so everything we're doing with convergence is very important. Now, um, before we start with these particular tests that I just mentioned, I want to talk about a little bit of terminology that we actually can cover when we finish uh, discussing uh, alternating series. And since I didn't add some of that at the end of the lecture, I want to go ahead and give you some terminology that I think you'll find to be uh, very uh, useful. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Now, this basically, as I've written at the top of the page here, is just terminology. And it's very, it's very useful terminology. And we need to be able to access it as we go into the uh, ratio and root tests. So what we want to do now, if you recall, with the alternating series, we would have a positive term sequence and attach to that the alternating sign, the minus one to the raised to the power of n plus one. So that was to highlight the fact that the series was actually alternating uh, by our definition. So what we want to do now is basically combine all of that into one sequence and call it u sub n, just, just to make the uh, definitions a little bit easier to work with. So what we want to do is the following. For instance, we will say that a particular infinite series, which is generated by this sequence here, converges absolutely when the infinite series of absolute values of the sequential terms converges. Okay, so that is what we call absolute convergence. That is when this particular series converges. So that's a very simple definition. Now, if we go back to the same series, we will state that the series here generated by the sequence u sub n converges conditionally, if and only if. Well, firstly, the series as is converges, but the series of the absolute values diverges. That's what we call conditional convergence. And they're very simple examples. If you, if you think about the harmonic series, it diverges. Uh, but if you allow it to alternate in sign, it will converge by the alternating series test. So that, that is one of the uh, simplest uh, versions of uh, conditional convergence that we can talk about. And just to remind you, let me just go ahead and write it here. This is a very famous series and has been studied, <laughs> volumes of study. So for instance, when we consider the harmonic series, the, the, the most straightforward test was to use the interval test to show that this diverged. However, if we append the alternation of sine, As the alternating series, this series converges by the alternating series test. So this would be our original series. And then of course, if you place the absolute values, the, the negatives absorb and you result with the standard harmonic series, which diverges. So this makes an excellent example of a conditionally convergent series. And so you can see how you can look at the P series and make some nice examples of that. So, so again, this may not seem that important right now, but the next test that we study will include the absolute value in the test. So they will actually be tests for absolute convergence, which is an improvement. 
We like when we have very robust tests like the interval test, but not all, all series tests are that nice <laughs> and, and useful. So uh, just remember that as we continue our work. Now, I wanted to give you a very simple result that students find very convenient in calculus. And it's very simple to prove. That is, if you have a series that is absolutely convergent, then the series of terms that are added without the absolute value also converges. So, so I guess the term absolute convergence is, is very powerful sounding. And so it really does give you a, a nice result. That is, if you have this, now it might be that the, the absolute values don't make any material change. Maybe the sequence does not alternate in sign, but clearly if it does have sign changes, not necessarily alternating, if you remove them, the series without absolute values also converges. So, so what, what's interesting about this is that when we make this original definition here, this is just simply a byproduct. That is, if we just keep thinking about what this means, um, do we get additional information? And we definitely do. So, so the absolute convergence is very powerful. And why would it be? I mean, you know, you think about you think about little epsilon channels when you study uh, limits and uh, sequences of functions, and you think about, you know, the absolute value as, as being a nice little channel that holds all of the good stuff inside. Things don't get too crazy. So if you remove the absolute value, uh, the behavior is still maintained to some degree. So it may not be too surprising that this is actually true. We have, we have seen results like this before, uh, and you will see more as you continue to study mathematics. Now, the, the proof is very simple, and, and sometimes the easy proofs are the hardest to construct. So what we do is make a very simple observation here. That is, if we add an expression and its absolute value, well, you know, we could get zero or we could get twice the absolute value term. So this very simple inequality gives us a nice result already. For instance, if we assume that this particular series of absolute values converges, then this series clearly does by this generating term, just a constant, which we know can be factored, a linear linearity property of convergent series. And so therefore, by the direct comparison test, this generating sequence, which is sandwiched between two times the absolute value of u sub n and zero will necessarily converge. So we get that just by the direct comparison test, as I've noted here. Now, this is just a preliminary uh, result to getting the result about the infinite series based upon u sub n. So again, we just take a very simple identity here. <laughs> We, we add and subtract the uh, generating sequence that we know something about. So we basically produce this generating sequence here. And so now what we've been able to do is rewrite the use of n in terms of a sum, so to speak, of sequences that provide us with convergent series. So now if we sum from n equal one to infinity, we get the series of the absolute value of u sub n plus u sub n, and then plus the negative of the uh, series of the absolute value of u sub n, both of which we know uh, converge. And basically, we have lovely linear properties for convergent series. So the given series here uh, with no absolute value must necessarily converge. So even though this is a very simple result, it, it, it should be something that's fairly straightforward uh, to, to uh, prove. And so again, you don't always say that a particular result is very, very powerful, uh, but you want to remember that because it is fundamental, 
it can certainly play a role in other problems that come up as you work math problems and other STEM problems as you continue your studies. So, so though this is a little bit off the beaten path, uh, the, these are results that are very useful. And the new terminology, absolute convergence, conditional convergence, simply adds uh, some useful vocabulary uh, to your calculus understanding. Now, what we want to do is state the result of the ratio test and also state the result of the root test. Now, the tests are fairly simple to prove because they use uh, the convergence of a uh, geometric series and therefore are fairly straightforward and, and fundamental in their approach. But the one thing about the ratio test is that it has so many ramifications when it comes to a uh, series of functions, power series, uh, it's an indispensable tool. Um, and then of course you could spend, you know, some time deciding uh, which uh, test is stronger than the other, the ratio test or the root test, but, but we won't worry so much about that. Uh, you will find in your studies that there are more powerful tests that go beyond the ratio and root test uh, by Abel that, that are stronger in the sense that they deal with more interesting series. Uh, one thing that you'll notice about the ratio test is if you look at part three, you have this inconclusive nature. And there are often times when you can simply just apply another test and be fine. But there are instances when you need a more powerful result. And as you continue to study, uh, you will be, a made, be made aware of some of these more powerful uh, uh, convergence uh, theorems. Now, how does this test work? Well, we start off with a generating sequence of non-zero terms. And then we look at this particular ratio. That's why it has the name ratio test. We simply take the ratio of successive terms. It is customary to write the a sub n plus one term and then below the a sub n term. This is what we call the ratio test. As we move out into the sequence, we take the ratio of two consecutive terms. That is the n plus one term being in the numerator, the n term being in the denominator. And this is how the theory moves forward. And then what we allow ourselves to do is take the limit of this ratio as n passes to infinity, which is what we do when we take limits of sequences. We call that L just for convenience. Uh, many textbooks will use this in order to make the statement of the theorem a little bit easier. Now, what we do is we break this down into categories. If this particular limit is between zero and strictly less than one, then the conclusion is that the actual series converges absolutely. That is a strong result. That is, remember, the ratio test is a test for absolute convergence. It's easy to forget this because you just start working with the algebra and you forget what you're doing. Okay, now the other case that is of interest to us is the following. If you compute the limit here and you get a number greater than one, then you get divergence, divergence. So you can look at this test and think, well, hmm, what would be convenient for ratios? You know, if you've got powers, if you've got factorials, when, when, when you have many factors that would absorb and leave you with just a few factors, maybe the limit will not be that difficult to compute. Uh, we often find when we've got uh, generating sequence with products, like I said, with the powers, with the factorials, that kind of characteristic is very easy for taking ratios. That is, 
you want something that that will blend well with taking ratios. Some's not so good, obviously, but we we when we factor, we love products. We 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 think products are just easy to work with, and computers even like products. Now, as I said before, the very last row is the one that I mentioned initially. This is the inconclusive determination. So it's like when you're trying to apply a test, a convergence test, and you can. You don't get a deduction. You can't say, well, it doesn't apply, so it must diverge. Well, no, that makes no sense. <laughs> the test either applies or it doesn't. And so when you get this result, you, you need to look into something else. You need to try another test. You need to look for another convergence test that can, that can apply and, and give you a conclusion. So, so that's the one drawback about the ratio test, but, but not a big deal. Now, before I talk about some of the reasons as to why it's true, I want to go ahead and give you the root test. And it's the same thing. Notice here we can do we can do the same thing with the L. Let me just go ahead and write this in. So n passes to infinity, and now we're doing the absolute value of the generating sequence, and we're taking its nth root. And then, of course, we have the same situation: zero to one, and then we have L bigger than one, and then we have L equal to one. So this just, this just makes it a little bit simpler to look at the cases. It's not required, but, but often when you write a theorem and you say less than one, no one ever thinks about zero, because when we think about the limit comparison test, um, the L must be greater than zero. So the, the, there, there, there are certain things that, that our minds start to tell us to preclude, and we don't necessarily need to do that. So when we look at this, the L categories are just as we have with the ratio test. But now the limit, instead of taking ratios, we, again, you can take the nth root of zero. So you're not necessarily looking at uh, sequences that where all the terms are non-zero, but usually that is the case. So now we're just saying, okay, the limit is n passes to infinity again of the absolute value of the generating sequence to its nth root or its nth power. So again, this is a test for absolute convergence. And so, the same as before. If L is between zero and one, it could be equal to zero, but strictly less than one, we get absolute convergence. If L is bigger than one, we get divergence. And of course, now, just like before, if L is equal to one, uh, we get inconclusive. Now, students will say, you know, I probably could just get away with applying the uh, ratio test. I mean, it's so simple. Well, the root test just gives you that additional choice. And for instance, if you have fractions raised to nth powers or some uh, integer power of n, that would be easily simplified with an nth root, the ratio test is very nice. Of course, the just depending on the structure, it, it just it is going to mean what limits do you know? For instance, if you do the nth root and you're kind of left with one, is that a special limit that you know? So again, this is simply giving you some additional power and a little bit more flexibility uh, when you're actually applying convergence tests. And so you always have the choice to choose one test over the other. I think it's always interesting when we pick the root test and we think in the back of our minds, would the ratio test have worked or whatever? 
Uh, in most cases, uh, students are just happy to, to get something that's legitimately done and a result that they understand. Now, what I want to do is just say a little bit about the proof of the ratio test. And if you're interested, the, the proof of the uh, root test is, is actually quite similar. But I just want you to believe the test. And I'll look at the particular uh, case where L uh, is less than one. And so this is what I want to talk about. And it's very straightforward. Now, we just use the arithmetic of the real line. So what we want to do in this case is just now, I guess I could have used L here, but that's going to, you know, we think about that standing for the limit. And the way that I've set up my notation here is fairly standard. So, so I'm going to just go ahead and call this particular limit here R instead of L, maybe to be a little bit less confusing. And we're assuming here that R is between zero and one. And now in order to do our approximating and pick an appropriate epsilon, we're going to fix R between the lowercase r and one. We, we use the continuum of the real line, many numbers to, <laughs> to pick from an uncountably infinite number of them. So we just squeeze the uppercase r between the lowercase r and one. And that gives us an excellent candidate for an epsilon. Now, how you want to phrase this from here on out is completely up to you. You can have greater than or equal to or strictly greater than. However you want to set up your logic is, is completely up to you. Now, here's what I've done, and this seems to be fairly standard. Now, because we have the existence of this limit, we just take in a natural number, doesn't have to be, but we'll choose that, such that if the lowercase n is greater than n, then we can make the actual ratio of the absolute value of a sub n plus one divided by a sub n within the epsilon of the limit r. So again, we take our epsilon to be r minus r. And we found that in our uh, computations with limits, a, a good choice of epsilon can definitely get us down the road where we want to be. So now what we want to do is look at the absolute value to the right. When we think about this conjunction, we have a negative of the uh, uppercase R minus lowercase r, but we're just going to look to the right here. So this will give us the absolute value term minus r less than uppercase r minus the lowercase r. And then, of course, the lowercase r is absorbed. But this is the beauty of this argument. This gives us a nice toggle here where we can now use this particular ratio to actually solve for successive terms where n is bigger than uppercase n. So now if we just quote unquote solve, we see that the absolute value of a sub n plus one, here we're referring to the uppercase n, will be less than r times the absolute value of a sub n. But then we just iterate the process. And by iterating the process, we actually increase the value of r with each succession, as you see here, this is a very simple process. That is now, when we bump up to n plus two, we get the same cross multiplication, but we also have an upper bound for the n plus one term in absolute value, which is this. And so we can simply make a substitution, which will increase the power of R with each successive estimation. So that's what's really elegant about this. But then, of course, what you're seeing is that the R in absolute value is less than one. And as the powers increase, that, that generates a, a convergent uh, geometric sequence. So, so how simple is that? This argument is elegant and, and is just a standard piece of, of real analysis. And, and every calculus student should know it. It, it's, it just utilizes your basic pre-calculus understanding. And so now what we can do with this particular mechanism is we can think of all of the terms that preceded the, say in this case, the nth term. So, so we'll just 
we'll just say, well, actually, you know, go all the way up the end. And then after that, we'll just deal with n plus one, n plus two, et cetera. So these terms are denoted here. That's a finite number. Clearly, no problem with convergence. And so now we look at all of the terms that follow. That is starting with the term bigger than n, n plus one, as I've notated it here with k equal one, where k will iterate starting with one on out to infinity. But now by our estimations here, we can simply replace this absolute value with the corresponding uh, k power of r. And then of course, the absolute value of a sub n, which is in all of these, uh, but, but relative to k that is fixed, so it can be factored. Well, the, the beauty of all of this is as you see, I've written here, this just simply generates a convergent geometric sequence by virtue of the fact that R is less than one. And of course, in absolute value less than one, that's quite important too. So we have finite and finite. We have a, a number here that's non-intimate. And therefore, the series that we are now considering, uh, the absolute values of A sub N, gives us absolute convergence. That is now we can just say the series without uh, absolute values converges absolutely just by a comparison test here. So so sometimes sometimes the proofs are so simple they we think, well, we just made that up. Um, just remember uh, when you work with proofs in calculus, any any way you decide to set it up, as long as the arithmetic is legitimate and you are using properties, uh, that, that you already know, then you can fashion an argument that, that works well. Uh, this just happens to be a very standard uh, type of argument, uh, the geometric series being so important in the study of convergence. Uh, I, I tell my students many times, I asked a complex analyst one time, I said, you know, especially when I was in grad school, I said, well, what would we do without the geometric series? And her comment was, well, we'd have to find something else and probably have to work a little harder. And I completely agree. <laughs> we, we are lucky to have what we have. So what I want to do now is look at some simple examples. You have some of these in your lecture notes. And also what I've done here is I've just made a listing of several different types of examples that you can use uh, when it comes to dealing with the ratio test. And I'll do several, but just do a couple uh, with the uh, root test. Now, like I said before, these are not difficult and, and how it's like doing an improper interval, okay? Or doing a definite interval. Do you break the problem down into pieces and work on each piece, then put it back together? I mean, sometimes when I'm teaching integration, I'll just focus on the, the big F, the antiderivative, get that nice and clean. And if I need to evaluate it, I can do that. Or if I need to pass to a limit because I have an improper interval, I'll do that. And how you want to fashion this is completely up to you. What I've done here is I've tried to drag along the limiting process uh, with the, the execution of the problem. Now, again, if you don't care to do that, you are certainly fine to look at the ratio and then move that computation back to the limit. This just doesn't seem to be as, as busy as working with integrals. Again, your choice. I just think that this is okay to do, but you simply utilize a technique that will help you keep your work organized. Now notice this particular series here. We have n equal one to infinity, and we have in the generating sequence, n minus one quantity factorial divided by four to the n. Now, when you think about factorials, you, you don't, that doesn't mesh very well with the construct of a derivative. Uh, we were thinking integrals, no, uh, not something that, that we really want to have to contend with. Um, there's certainly ways to, to work around things when, when that is required. But at this point, 
this is where the ratio test comes in very handy. So notice, like I've said before, we have the existence of factorials and we have the existence of integer powers. And so this really just says ratio test. So what we have is this is our a sub n. So this part here is what we call our a sub n, or you could call it u sub n. It doesn't matter when I did my proof earlier because I was trying to combine the alternation of sign with, with the other part that was supposedly just positive. That was fine, but we'll go ahead and stick with this. Now, when you look at this, you're thinking, okay, what we want to do is to replace n with n plus one and put that in the numerator. So that gives us replacing n with n plus one will just leave us with an n factorial. And then of course, four to the n plus one. So that again, replace n with n plus one. But now what we want to do is to divide by a sub n. Now, what I usually tell students, instead of writing a complex fraction, it might be a little bit simpler just to invert. And let me go over here and uh, close my uh, email so it doesn't ding every time I'm trying to speak to you. So now, again, like I said before, just go ahead and reciprocate instead of writing the complex fraction. Now, what I tell students is to, at this point, pair, pair the common terms. That is, put the factorials together, put the powers of four together. And notice what I've done here is I've written four to the n plus one is four times four to the n. Now, one thing that you might notice here, and this is very important, n factorial by definition is just n times n minus one factorial. I'll go ahead and write that out since I didn't write that there. And so what we see is the n minus one factorials absorbed and also the four to the n's absorbed and they just leave us with n over four, okay? So again, notice, absorb, absorb, and then absorb, absorb. Now, interestingly enough, when we look at this, we're left with the n and we're left with the four. That's a very simple limit to compute. Well, it doesn't exist. And so now we're thinking, well, that, that was simple. Again, look at the ratio of successive terms. A sub n plus one divided by A sub n in absolute value. Now you're thinking you just kind of dropped your absolute values. Well, these are positive terms, so I don't, I don't have to continue with them. The idea is you have an alternation inside, the absolute values will absorb that because you can just look at the n as being fixed before you pass to the limit. Just like when you're working on an antiderivative, you do your algebra, you do your calculus and all, then boom, you apply the antiderivative. And then if you need to, you pass to a limit if it's improper. So again, remember, do all of your work and then let n pass to infinity. Now, of course, since this does not exist, this means that the given uh, series diverges, which is not at all surprising. The factorial function becomes very large very quickly, and it even overpowers the power functions, if you can believe it. Again, not very surprising. Now, another thing that you might be thinking um, you can always look at the nth term divergence test. For instance, you know, if a series converges, its generating sequence must have limit zero. And when you look at this particular example, you have n squared and you have five over six raised to the nth power. And you're thinking, you know, this five over six is less than one as the n gets larger and larger. That will overtake the n squared. Well, you don't have to look at that so much as doing a uh, proof, for instance, you're thinking, do I, you know, do I break this up and try to use L'Hopital's rule or whatever? Um, 
you can often just say, okay, that looks reasonable and just move to the uh, ratio test. But if you want to investigate this further, please go ahead. I think you'll find it to be very interesting. But just remember, just remember, once you've convinced yourself that the limit of the generating sequence is zero, that doesn't get you off the hook, as you well know. You still have to check for convergence. The thing is, is that any convergent series will have a generating sequence that converges to zero, but that has nothing to do with going in the reverse direction, as we well know with the harmonic series. So now what we can do is just do the n plus one, one term divided by the n plus first term, excuse me, n plus one term divided by the nth term. I don't need to say that twice. So now, if you like, we'll have n plus one quantity squared as we have here. And notice we have five over six to the n plus one that we have here. Again, this is not, we're just writing this as it exists as a product. So we're not really breaking it up into a fractional part. So it's kind of simple. And then of course the nth term is just as it is, n squared five over six raised to the n power. Now, when you look at this, this is actually very simple. It's everything's already paired up. Notice we have the n plus one quantity squared divided by the n squared. So we can just use the laws of exponents to write that as n plus one divided by n quantity squared. And now of course here, we have n factors of five, six, and here we have n plus one. So the n factors upstairs and downstairs absorb, and we're just left with five, six. So very simple algebra. You'll, you'll, you'll find that, that you feel like you're in algebra one class again, because you're just dealing with basic constructs, again, that you didn't probably rigorously prove at that time, but, but you're using a lot of basic fundamental uh, strategies. Now, of course, this is simply reduced as much as we, we need it to be. The five, six, of course, we can uh, factor in the limit, and now we can just use continuity and run the limit inside. And now, of course, we have the ratio of leading coefficients, which is one. So the limit of this part is clearly one squared, which is one times five, six. Well, the five, six kind of comes to our rescue as we thought it would. And of course, we have a limit that is less than one. So by the ratio test, the given series converges absolutely. Now, now you're thinking, well, you know, you didn't write absolutely. Well, that's a positive term series. So it's maybe a little bit redundant, but you could say absolutely converges just to be, just to be precise. But again, just remember, not all series will change sign and they and, or and, and if they do it not may not be in a programmed way like an alternating uh, series. So just remember uh, to be to be careful to, to learn the uh, terminology, just remember root test ratio test test for absolute convergence. Now what I wanted to do was an example of where we actually get, a conclusion that, that we can't do anything with. And that's this next example. And it looks a little odd because when you think about it, you, you look at this and say, well, you know, maybe I would just start with the alternating series test since it's indeed an alternating series. Well, we're not gonna always be in that situation. We're gonna figure out that the McLaurin series for sine and cosine are alternating series. So there you go. Um, and so it's not going to be something that we're going to think, oh, we have to use the alternating series test. We are much more going to be poised to use ratio tests because they make much more sense. Uh, and when we discuss uh, the radius of convergence and the interval of convergence, so to speak, uh, the ratio test will play a large role. But notice here, Here's an alternating series. Here is our a sub n. So we're thinking, okay, what, what harm is there to apply the ratio test? So now the thing is, we start with n being replaced with n plus one. So we have negative one to the n plus two. n plus two becomes n plus three. All of these 
we would just uh, replace n with n plus one. So we have n plus one times n plus two. And now we divide by the original a sub n. Now, when you think about that, you're just flipping everything. So just put this on top, n times n plus two. And then of course, the negative one to the n plus one divided by n plus two. So just go ahead and reciprocate um, instead of writing the complex fraction. That, that just gets too tedious and, and you're apt to make many more mistakes if you do it that way. So take the time to, to think about uh, what I've said. I think you'll find it a little bit easier. Now notice, we just simply go through and see what can absorb. Some things will absorb, other things will not absorb. It looks like we just have a mixed mash of factors that don't go anywhere. But now notice we have n plus one copies of negative one and we have n plus two here. So we're just left with one. We just have a negative one. But notice, notice if you just wanna pair things up in any way, notice I didn't really use anything systematic here. I just paired the n plus three with the n plus two. I just paired the, uh, it looks like the n with the n plus two and then the n plus one with the n plus one. Notice this is like doing uh, uh, Riemann sums when you're uh, doing the integral via the limit of the Riemann sum. And you could multiply everything out and waste your time, or you could use uh, the limit of a product as the product of limits. But notice now with the absolute value, the negative one absorbs and we're just left with this limit of a product. And what could be easier? We just have what ratio of leading coefficients? Well, these are all one, so the limit is indeed one, one times one times one, okay? Not surprising. So, so again, um, when we look at this, we're thinking, yeah, uh, the ratio test is not really gonna help when, when if I originally looked at it and thought, yeah, probably the alternating series test would be the best, but. But I think when we're learning a new convergence uh, technique, um, why not try it? So now what I've written here, now use alternating series. So we're back to the, you know, the old song and dance. <laughs> you know, it says, need calculus, ratio test inconclusive, use another test, alternating series test. I always make these comments in my notes and, and I have notes on my notes, you know, so what I try to do is share with you some ideas that don't necessarily come in the notes that you have online. So now when you look at this, you're thinking, okay, well, this is an alternating series. So we just remove ourselves uh, from the alternating part and look at the positive term uh, sequence we, that we call A sub N. N note every text will have a different way of defining the alternating series, we're, we're sticking with this. Now, when we look at this, we're thinking, oh, this is easy. You know, we can just go ahead and multiply here. And now, of course, we have a lower degree in the numerator, n tends to infinity. This limit is clearly zero. Well, for the alternating series test, we must have that the a sub n indeed has limit zero. And then we must show that the a sub n is non-increasing. Okay, so we've got monotonicity to deal with. So in, in some cases, depending on the problem you're working with, you can, you can just do some simple algebra. But here, I think that won't work as well. For instance, I look at this and think about cross multiplying and, and, and then trying to look at how uh, we could actually work some algebra here. And then I'm thinking need calculus. The, the idea is that in many times the algebra is inconclusive. So what I would suggest is simply moving this into the real realm, that is X plus two divided by X times X plus two. Now, of course, I just went ahead and followed the, the same routine here and wrote it this way, and then just applied the uh, quotient rule. So again, the quotient rule is very simple here. Notice we have the derivative of x plus two times x squared plus x minus x plus two times the derivative of x squared plus x, which is two x plus one. And then of course we divide by uh, the denominator squared. 
And so now here we have x squared plus x, and we just simply uh, multiply all of this out. Notice we have a 2x squared. We have the outer and the inner term, which gives us 5x. And then we have the last term, which is 2, all hit it with a negative, no negatives inside. So that was pretty simple. So x squared minus 2x squared is negative x squared. X minus a 5x is a negative 4x. And of course, a negative 2, we get this. Now, what I did here is just apply the uh, quadratic formula because we actually end up with a quadratic that does not have rational zeros. So what we get here, we get zeros negative 2 minus root 2, and then we get negative 2 plus root 2. So what we can see here is that this will be sufficient. That is, when we do our sign test here, we know that for any real number uh, greater than negative 2, plus root two, of course we could go that way, but we're not interested in that. We're gonna get uh, uh, a decreasing first derivative. That means that the function is decreasing or in other words, non-increasing, okay? So, so with that, we get the fact that the sequence, now we can move right back to the integers, the natural numbers, because the real limit, the real calculus gives us uh, qualities that when we restrict, we still get the use of that quality. And so this function is giving us non-increasing as a sequence. And therefore, by the alternating series test, with the additional information that a sub n has limit zero, we have convergence. So this is just an example where you may find yourself with limit one, and you're just looking for a way to, okay, what can I do now? What can I use? What method will help me uh, to find a conclusion? Uh, and many times you can. There will certainly be times when you might be working with the ratio of root test and, and you don't get a conclusion and, and you've, got to, you've got to look for a new test altogether. Don't be surprised with that, but that'll be a growth situation, which is fine. Now, what I wanted to do are some examples with the root test. Now, the first one here, I've got two, which are very simple. But, but again, what I want you to know is that you definitely have choice when it comes to dealing with uh, ratio and root test. Let me just show you here how the root test is very effective. Notice we have a very interesting real series. We have n equals zero to infinity, and we have e to the negative three n. Now you can work your laws of exponents any way you want. What I've done here is certainly not unique. Um, and and you, can, you can relax uh, negative powers, do whatever you want, however you want, and, and still get the same result. But in this case, what I decided, converge or diverge, I thought, okay, well, you've got this convenient nth power here with the negative three, no big deal. We'll just go ahead and take the limit of the absolute value of this generating sequence, nth rooted. Again, the root test provides us with the nth root. And now, of course, we can just use our laws of exponents and the properties of absolute value, because now when we're working in this, we can think of n as being fixed. So we have e to the negative three uh, rate in absolute value raised to the n, also raised to the one over n power. Of course, that's just a positive number. So the absolute values are gone. And then of course, with the laws of exponents, the n over one plus n, of course the light goes out and I've got to have motion in the room. And those two uh, uh, factors in the exponent absorb. Okay, and now of course you're thinking that just leaves us with the constant. Well, e to the minus three is just one over e to the three. That's a constant. So as n passes to infinity, we have the limit, which is clearly less than one. So we get convergence by the root test. And of course, it's absolutely converges. I'll just go ahead and write that in. Again, this does not change sign, but this is a test for absolute convergence. So let's get used to thinking about that. We, we sometimes just leave it out. It certainly doesn't weaken the result, um, but, but there certainly could be times when the actual uh, sequence does change sign, and, and that's an important result. 
um, <laughs> you know, that we we find that that when we stick to the terminology as closely as possible, we don't find ourselves in a gap when when we've left it out. Now, here's this next one. Th this example down here at the bottom is just an extra with the uh, ratio test, which is interesting, but I'm not really going to say much about it. I want to do more with the uh, the root test. Notice here, here, here's an example. If you think about this one, we have n equal one to infinity, and then we have a generating sequence, which is actually very similar to this one. It's just the natural log of n divided by n raised to the nth power. Now, when you think about this, you know, n equal one, the log of one is zero, but we still end up with uh, non-negative terms in our series. So we, you know, we, we overkill with the absolute value, but since we have the end here, we think, you know, root test will be easy, very simple. Not everything has to be difficult and certainly don't second guess yourself, just apply the result. And so now we have the absolute value of the natural log of n divided by n raised to the nth power in absolute value nth rooted. Now, of course, at this point, you can apply the absolute value in the sense that this is not going to change signs, so there's nothing that's going to be uh, uh, obvious about this transition here, except for the fact that if you like, we can go ahead and move using properties of absolute value or just leave them out. It doesn't really matter. We have natural log of n divided by n raised to the nth power. And then, of course, by the laws of exponents, these two uh, factors will absorb, leaving us with a one. So now you can, again, you can drop the absolute values here. And now I've dropped them. We know these are positive terms, so, so we don't have to worry about that anymore. And of course, now we have uh, indeterminate form, basically infinity over infinity. That's kind of the simplest case possible. We didn't have to do any algebra or apply continuity. We already have a log function anyway, right? And so when we apply L'Hopital's rule, we have one over n divided by n, again, which collapses to a limit as n passes to infinity of one over n, the limit clearly zero. Now, again, converges. So absolutely, absolutely converges by the root test. Again, you, you can often find yourself trying a particular test, looking through what you have and deciding, well, you know, for just for grins, let me just see what would have happened if I applied this test. Um, if you have the luxury of doing that when you're studying, go right ahead. If you're working with another student, you're tutoring them or whatever, give them the, uh, the flexibility of showing them had they started with this, uh, just to see what the conclusion would be. But I will say this, when you have clear powers here that would be made very simple by use of the uh, root test, I would take advantage of it. Now, there was one other example that I wanted to talk about. I've got this example that I just did or, I, or something very similar to it here uh, with, a, with an alternation of sign. Uh, which actually turns out to be a very interesting problem, but, but not very difficult. Let me just go ahead and talk about both of them. For This was similar to the last one. And when you look at this, you, you, wanna, you just want to use the fact that, that you understand arithmetic. So notice here, we have a series that starts n equal to, to infinity, okay, of negative one to the n, divided by the natural log of n to the n, that very interesting real series. Now, of course, in both cases, we have powers of n. So, so you're thinking, why didn't they just write that, you know, as an umbrella n or whatever? I, I think the idea was just to kind of highlight the fact that this is alternating. And then, of course, if we start with two, uh, the logs are all positive, so no problem there. This is indeed an alternating uh, series. And so you're thinking, maybe I could use the alternating series test, but you see all these powers of n, and you're thinking, wow, this is really great for root tests. 
So you simply do that. You place the a sub n, or in this case, we just call that the u sub n since it's got all the alternation of sign in it. Just make sure whatever you call it that you don't ascribe some other definition to it from another test. That would be a problem. So just say this includes everything. So we put this in the absolute values and raised to the nth root. And now we can just utilize properties of the absolute value. At this point, the way you navigate this is completely up to you. And as I write these problems out, it's just the way you might be thinking at the time. Nothing, nothing difficult, but everybody has a different way of interpreting things. So of course, the absolute value uh, of the uh, quotient is the quotient of absolute values. So at this point, we look at this as uh, n being fixed. And so we, if we have a positive sign or we have a negative sign, the absolute value certainly absorbs. So we're done with that. And then, then of course, uh, one or negative one to any power, the, the n's not going to matter. So that's just going to leave us a one here. So one raised to the one over n power, which clearly is one. And now, of course, in the denominator, again, we've got the same thing going on. We simply see that the n's in the one over n absorbs. And then, of course, we lose the absolute values because for these values of two uh, and greater, or values of n, two and greater, uh, we have a positive term with the natural logarithm. So we can retire that. So what I did at this point is just retired the absolute values. And then of course the n and the one over n absorb, leaving us with one over natural log of n. Now, of course, as n passes to infinity, n passes to n, logarithm of n passes to infinity. It's an increasing function. It takes its time, but it certainly increases as n passes to infinity. So this limit is clearly zero. Zero is less than one. So converges by the root test and we'll say absolutely. It's real easy to forget about that absolutely. So now, now of course, we, we have a nice result here. We know that this converges absolutely. So if we wanted to remove the alternation of sign and just write it as one over the nth power of the natural logarithm of n, that would also be a convergent series. So we could just say, using our theorem that we proved at the beginning of the lecture, n equal two to infinity of one divided by natural log of n. And if you want, you can just go ahead and put the n right out here. <laughs> you know, you don't have to leave it downstairs. That converges. And we get that for free. Because again, this is a test for absolute convergence due to the absolute values. And I'm not taking the absolute values lightly. You have to, you have to interpret the absolute values. But in many cases, it's quite simple. And, and, and we like simplicity. But again, just think of the fact that, that as we before we let n pass to infinity, we were envisioning this n as being fixed. And then that allows us to say, well, negative one to any integer power or any power for that matter is either one or minus one. And so in that case, we're thinking, okay, well then we've got the, the absolute value of that and that gives us one. And then of course, when we have crazy powers of, of, of you know, the bases, we, we can change the base to exponential. I mean, you can do whatever you want. Real analysis is, is, is fascinating and, and has so many elegant properties. And we have to remind ourselves that we can continue to use them, use them correctly, but use them. So now, again, that was a nice example. I just wrote something here about the fact that, that the natural logarithm is, is uh, an increasing function, um, uh, especially when you start in Cal 1 and you're trying to prove the properties of the natural log from the basic principles, or at least much more basic than you did in pre-Cal, which was not very good at all, but was the best you could do at the time. So now what I've got here, I think an interesting problem to conclude with. Now just remember, as we as we make our segue to power functions and polynomials and things of that sort, we can always replace x with a real number. And what we would want to do is to replace that x with the number for which the actual series would converge. 
And so that's where we're going to get the topic of interval of convergence. So if you have a series of functions, you're thinking, okay, well, if this particular series of functions will define an actual function, where does it, where does it converge? What is its domain? So what we're going to do is start thinking of a convergent power series as a function with domain of convergence. And so the domain of convergence just basically becomes the domain of the function like we thought about in college algebra. But we, we find that the, the transition to power series revolutionizes the way we think about functions and it re re revolutionizes our computational ability and then gives rise to how all these fancy gadgets that we've known throughout our lives called computers and calculators actually work. There is nothing magical about a calculator. It is a program piece of equipment that utilizes real analysis, the calculus, to do its computation. So, so calculus is here to stay. As I've said many times, it doesn't matter how how people will say, well, this is old, whatever, this is out of fashion. Well, it will never be out of fashion. The calculus is what runs our universe. The calculus is the language of, of science. It is the language of STEM. And, and we're kind of stuck with it. And even those that want to do finance have to know some calculus. You want to be a stock broker, you want to work for an insur insurance company, it is definitely going to be a part of your curriculum. So now, when I look at this, I just think about, you know, this looks so simple compared to what we've been doing, but I just wanted to end with an example. Now, just remember, regardless of what you have, uh, if you just got finite products divided by finite products, you use the ratio test, Pretty much everything just goes away. It all absorbs, except for just a few factors. So don't, don't kid yourself and apply a root test when it doesn't make sense. When you've got finite factors and you know everything's pretty much going to absorb if you take a ratio of two consecutive terms, then go that way. And, and you will see how powerful the ratio test is. Now, we're seeing how powerful the root test is, especially when we can eradicate powers and make the problem very, very simple. So don't, don't hang up your common sense approach when you apply these uh, new strategies. They are much simpler than computing an interval, okay? They are much simpler than trying to come up with an inequality or the comparison test. Trust me, the, this, this will make your life easier. And, and it'll be like when you learn L'Hopital's rule. Wow, that would have been so nice in Cal 1. But like I've said before, we blend all of the techniques to build our foundation. So notice here, um, we have what we consider to be a series. And, and what's interesting about this is, you know, we've got the N here, but we've got the three here. And, and, we, and we think about, you know, three, you know, you think, for instance, if we have, um, say, N equals two, I don't know, two times M, or N equals two times M plus one, where N is, M is a natural number. Okay, and then you say 3n, that's 6n, that's even. Clearly, that's even. I mean, I'm not overstating the obvious. But then you have 3n in the second case, which gives you 6m plus a 3. And of course, you know, you can absorb another 2 into that, but this is odd. So, so when you have something like this, you're, you're going to get some alternation uh, in sign, but it's going to be it's going to be a little bit different. So, so for instance, if you think about this, when you've got th one, you've got three. When you've got two, you've got six. And then when you've got three, you've got nine. When you four, you've got twelve. So you're going to get an alternation. You're going to get an alternation of sign, but through a different range of numbers not consecutive. 
So that's kind of interesting when you think about it. You know, don't ever don't ever just make assumptions about things. And maybe that was just really simple. You saw that, but but it is going to change sign. So now that these absolute values aren't just for null. So now when we think about this, we have three n. That was like when we had e to the minus three n, and we thought, okay, we'll, we'll apply the the root test. So notice here we'll just take the absolute value of negative three uh, n divided by two n plus one, all raised to three n power in absolute value, then nth rooted. Now at this point, if you like, it, at this point, I didn't really do anything. It looks like I just noticed the fact that, that now I can just move the absolute value in. That is here, we're just gonna move the absolute value into the power three n using the properties of the absolute value. Again, we can think of n as being fixed. And so the absolute value of a product being the product of absolute values. So we get this part here. Now, of course, we've got negative one times this fraction. Again, the fraction itself is positive. And so again, the absolute value of a product, product of absolute values, the negative absorbs. So just remember, just very simply, when you had the absolute value of xy, this is just the absolute value of x times the absolute value of y. We use that without thinking about it. But sometimes it's good just to go back and do a simple problem and remind ourselves that even if we get a little sloppy here, we're most likely going to be right on. But don't, don't go so fast, or if you're trying to help someone with this, be be a little bit more descriptive as I have been about why you do certain things, uh, because this tends to be a point where students falter uh, because these, these properties have gotten fairly rusty. And so now when you look at this, we've got a very simple situation. We're back to calculus one. Well, all this is calculus one anyway. And so now we can move the limited process inside by continuity. So we have the limit as n passes to infinity a 3n divided by 2n plus 1 raised to the third power. And of course, now we're back to pre-cal. Ratio of leading coefficients will be just three halves. And of course, three halves, well, we could stop there, but when we cube it, we get 27 over 8, which is clearly bigger than 1. So now the series diverges by the root test. So what, what I want you to be aware of here in these types of problems is that you've got a lot of mechanical work to do. It's kind of like, basically, if you, if you think about the third test where you were doing the Weierstrass Bier substitution or trigonometric, tri trigonometric substitution or partial fraction decomposition, those techniques are, are tedious in that they're lots of pieces. And every piece is important for the next part. I mean, everything comes together. You slip up a little bit, it just changes everything. You know, the, the limits don't work. You know, oh, I slipped here or whatever. So, so when you look at these types of problems, I don't think it is as tedious, but it certainly keeps you vigilant about what you have to do as you work through the problem because you don't want to make a, a step that's incorrect that moves the limit in the wrong direction, especially when the series convergence. So be very careful that as you absorb negatives or you absorb powers with exponent rules and things that you are making a, a substantiation as to why you do that. Just remember the n is fixed until you pass to the limit. So you can apply the finite properties, just like working with any uh, objects uh, in a convergent situation, just like doing Riemann sums, things of that nature. So none of that has changed. But I hope that you find that the, the ratio test and the root test are, are fun, and it certainly will help you to, to fine-tune your algebraic skills, even though I'm sure they're quite good as they are now. Um, we will continue this process with Taylor polynomials, power series, and then representation of functions via power series. And then of course, get a whole new list of, of, of convergent power series techniques, which you can add to your integral table uh, before we get into um, polar coordinates and their calculus. So I hope this has been helpful and, and we are done.